Okay, so my argument is fat grafting is salvation, not a curse, and the only way you really can do that is to really understand risk benefits limitations, and really you, in the right hands with the right technique, with the right judgment and the right communication, I think it can be salvation. So obviously, do we want this? Do we want someone that looks overfilled? You can show really bad fat grafting results, but you can show really bad facelifting and rhinoplasty results and say, okay, we'll never do a rhinoplasty. Well, that's not right. So you can get seamless results. And so the key here is to start with understanding what the limitations, risks, and benefits of the technology is for a patient. And communication is everything. If you don't communicate, you really can't deliver great results. So let's talk about first risk, because if you don't understand the risk, you can't understand what the benefits are. Fat is not bioinert. It is not a, just a filler. It is like a hair graft, and it changes with time, and you need to know that. The question a lot of people say, you know, say, fat doesn't survive, right? It doesn't survive. Yes, it does. I do lip corrections, and eight years later when I'm taking fat out of a lip, it's there. I see globules of fat. It is not scar tissue. It is not something sitting there. I've seen patients with weight fluctuations, which we'll talk about, that actually is a detriment when there's a significant weight fluctuation because it is not bioinert. If you look at lumpiness, and you look at overfilling, you look at bad results like that, that's technique. It is judgment and it's aesthetic uh, perception that is the problem more than anything else. I get very safe, reliable, consistent results with this, but I try to talk about the limitations. Other things of risk really is weight fluctuation. If you have a profile of a patient where they fluctuate, this is not bioinert. It is actually fat, and it does change with weight. So if someone is in the process of losing weight, I typically do it actually before they've lost the weight, about a third or halfway down. And if they have a history of constantly fluctuating in weight, I won't do it. So along those lines, you also have to understand if you're dealing with a person very young, there is risk. It's just like doing a hair transplant in a 20-year-old because over that lifetime, if you're doing a permanent treatment, you're going to see some changes. And that's something I always want to emphasize to someone. It is a permanent filler. I've looked at my patients now over 10 years, and I've seen that there are small changes that are sometimes great and sometimes not great. You need to discuss that. I was giving a talk a few years back in Colombia, um, Bogota, Colombia, and a, a surgeon came up to me and says, boy, I really, really wish I heard your talk before I injected this whole mandible on this 17-year-old because over time it started to get big because you're treating it with a fat that's, that is very different. It's donor fat. It's fat that behaves like in the, in the belly area. So if you're treating it to fix asymmetric, reconstructive, bony issues in young patients that are not metabolically stable, that's a curse. So you need to know what it is to, to do, do it well. I've, used, I've treated a treat your Collins patient who's done everything they could with soft tissue, uh, sorry, with, with bone and made it a really, really nice change so she could go back in the community and look great because I picked a patient that was more mature, uh, weight stable, that needed soft tissue envelope treatment. So let's talk about the limitations. I really believe the difference between education and an excuse is an education is told to, to a patient before and excuses afterwards. So I try to educate them over and over and over again. So I use three models, a glass of water, a face like a bed, and hair, hair grafts to understand those limitations. So is it permanent? Yeah. I've seen my patient a decade out and some of them look great. Some of them have aged more. They've got a lot of sun damage and there's progression of it. That glass of water that's filled up to a certain level is going to slowly, inexorably go down a little bit every year. And that's important. I just saw a patient a decade out just a couple weeks ago and she's really held her result really exceptionally well. I hadn't seen her because she moved out of the country and came back, but she didn't get a lot more sun damage. So if you get a lot of progressive aging over that time, you're going to have erosion of your result. And that's something you need a patient to understand. So it is permanent, but that glass of water is emptying. The second thing I like to talk about is a face like a bed. So what this means is that the fat is soft. It's placed deep like a mattress. It, it builds a deep foundation for the face. But if you start to try to use it as a neuromodulator and try to knock out a wrinkle, try to knock out a fold perfectly, you're not going to be successful and you're going to have a disappointed patient. So it's really, really important you understand that fat is a foundation work for the, for the face. It is not this little magic filler that you can go and stick in little nooks and crannies of the face and get a result. It's not reliable in that way. And so I'm a one-time fat grafting person. I'm not a person that sits here trying to do six or seven fat grafts because I think the technology for fat is not lend itself to re-inject and re-inject and re-inject. That's what a filler does. So you have to make the delinea delineation between what a fat grafting does well and what it doesn't do well. So going back to that concept of the hair transplant, what happens with a hair graft? When you put it in, does it grow in four days? No, it takes six months to a year. 
And so I, if you look at a fat graph, I think the large problem with a lot of physicians is they don't take standardized photographs and they don't watch it over time. So you need to watch your results before you say, oh, two months later, I'm gonna stick some more fat in there because it matures over a period of 12 to 18 months, just like a hair transplant. And it's because it's a graft. And so when other people say, well, a fat graft lasts three years, what the heck does that mean? So you're telling me a skin graft that you put in there is gonna all of a sudden get up and walk out in three years? It's a permanent graft. It doesn't survive 100%. It doesn't knock out skin flaws perfectly. It doesn't, it's not a neuromodulator. So you use the technology and you understand the limitations. You communicate those, those limitations to patients beforehand and you get satisfied patients. And so I look at fat grafting, and it's not exactly 80-20, but it's about an 80% fill for the face. It provides a very rapid, natural rejuvenation of the face, and it doesn't knock out everything. And so even in my patients, I come back and do some filler touch-ups to manage it and make it look a little better. But what is the point then? What is the singular benefit? For me, it improves the blink. In a second, you look at a person, and that person looks so much better with fat grafting. It's not going to fix all the small flaws. If you tell, I tell a patient, it's not going to fix the small flaws. But when I show before and after in standardized lighting, if you forgot what you used to look like, you're going to see a remarkable difference. You should look a lot softer for a woman, much more feminine, youthful, brighter, at a much less expense. And I'll show some examples in a moment of contrasting filler and fat results and understanding how I use both. So fat grafting has a bigger recovery and a bigger upfront cost, but in the long run, it can be less expensive and it can be maintained more beautifully um, with, with, um, with just a bigger one-shot downtime. But fillers, if you don't factor in those multiple small downtimes that you do over and over again, and the multiple small costs that add up potentially to uh, quite a bit more expensive than, than fat grafting. And so that's something that I try to emphasize. So this is a lady that came in. She had one syringe of uh, filler in her lips by someone else. And you can see with one syringe, it looks terrible. So you could argue never do fillers because they all look fake. But no, this is a correction I did. This is 20 syringes of fillers. And so w you do the math on that, that can be sig significantly more than fat. This is a lady that's 35 on the left and 42 on the right. Same lighting, same camera, same distance, no ambient light. Uh, but she looks, there's so much more light on that face and she's seven years older. This is over 40 syringes of fillers done slowly over time. And if you see that if she had done a fat graft, it could have been a lot less expensive. But this is an example of going the filler route, which today I really believe with uh, Steve that we have the modalities of minimally invasive if we need to do those procedures for the patient and still make them look great if, they're, if they don't need a facelift quite yet. There's an example of a lady that's after a fat graft, it's not flawless. If you look at under her eyes, you look around the mouth, it's, it's not a great result, but does it change the blink? Does it make you feel different about this 40-some-year-old face? The answer is hopefully yes. And then I came back, did some small permanent fillers like Artifil around the eyes, just touch it up, made her look a little softer, and this is just taking up another small two notches, and then this is from beginning to end. It just takes those two to three steps forward that helps you get there. So if, I like doing little fillers to touch up my fat results. Another example of a lady in her mid-50s, you can see after a fat graft result, she has a little bit more makeup in the eyes, I apologize, but she looks softer, more youthful, and more rested. And then you come back and you just touch up a little bit around the mouth and the eyes, make it a little bit better in areas where I think fillers excel better, which is small deficits where you just can't quite nail it with the fat. Instead of going back 50 times, you just go once with fat, lay the foundation, and touch up small areas in the office, and you get overall from beginning to end, I believe, a softer, uh, nice result in someone in the mid-50s who may not be ready for a facelift at that time. So bottom line with this is that don't condemn a procedure, but understand the limitations of that procedure. Communicate it better with your patients, and do aesthetic work. If you're doing aesthetic work, that will transmit to all fields, all areas of, of your practice. Thank you very much. Thank you.